What's up, everybody? Ara El Avinu here with Fully Deconverted. I am your usual host, but we're going to present something. Um, we have a Facebook Fully Deconverted group, if you don't know. And uh, in that group, you know, we have other moderators, team members, staff members. And um, what we encourage is discussion, discourse. And in this installment, what you're going to see is um, Kevin Waddy, our operations officer, and one of our contributing writers, uh, Zek Gumfer, uh, holding a discussion with some other persons. I think you'll find this interesting. It will be with other theists, namely Hunter Bailey and uh, RC Apologist, whoever that is. <laughs> but anyways, um, that's what you're going to be seeing today. This will not be like our regularly scheduled programming. This will be a pre-recorded and then uploaded uh, program. So with that said, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Uh, it runs for a while, so there should be a lot of good content in there that you may appreciate. And let's get right to it. Okay, here we go. Okay, everybody, we have uh, Zek over here and Hunter on the line. We've got uh, right now two atheists or two um, non-theists and one theist, and maybe a, hopefully another theist coming on pretty soon. Um, so Hunter. That's my name. Uh, yeah. Um, tell me, because I'm fascinated by pre-atomism. I've, I've been, I've been it, 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 you know, I've been in theology. I've gone to theology school, uh, one school actually, and studied the theologians on my own. And I've heard all the apologetics, and I was an apologist and all that. But I've never heard of pre-atomism. Tell me about it. Um, well, first of all, we have to define um, what you think pre-atomism is. There's different theories to this. So yeah. before, before I can tell you what it is, um, or at least we got to find common ground, you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, there's no gaps or holes or any misunderstanding. So what, do you, what, do you, what did you learn pre-atomism is? And then I'll tell you what I think of pre-atomism is. Okay, well, I first heard about it, I think, from you. And then I went on a search, um, listening to Hugh Ross doing a Wikipedia search and a Google search and all over the place, Google yes. Scholar search. And um, it's meant different things throughout the millennia, I guess. Um, so yeah, you're right. It's just meant many things. Um, yeah. The only thing I know. You, so you work with, because you said you also learned it in, when you went to seminary school as well. So I'm curious what they taught. No, I, I didn't learn it. I didn't learn that. Oh, okay, okay. Gotcha. That's the one thing I did not learn. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, now maybe I wasn't paying attention, but <laughs> I didn't learn it. <laughs> well, <in> my life. <laughs> yeah, but okay, so uh, um, that God created, it, it's kind of more like an old earth creation type theory, right? In that category of old earth creationism, maybe? Mm, depends. Um, okay. There's really, to my knowledge, there's only two theories that hold into it. It's the gap theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if y'all ever heard of that. I don't hold it on to that. And there's also the um, evolution creation, or if you want to call it theistic evolution, however, where there's uh, people before Adam, and Adam was just picked off and mm -hmm. uh, chosen um, mm -hmm. as a priest representative uh, to represent all of mankind. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how Jesus is the second Adam, um, yeah. and he was, um, he was sacrificed to represent all of mankind to this, for the sins of literally everything. So, what I like, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Zach. I was just saying, there's those two. Oh. Um, oh, no, nothing. I'm just collecting that. No, keep going. Yeah. There's, um, there's one thing I really like about it is um, you've heard Christ or atheists and even Christians um, ask the question, who did Cain marry? Right. Right. Or, or he went, Cain went to the city of Nod. Wait, there was a city? How, how could that possibly be, right? Yep. Or where, where the heck are the Nephilim? You know, wh who are they? You know, and, and then Christians say, well, they were, you know, angels that made it with human women. And then some people say, no, they were pre-Adamic people that made it with um, Adamic people. Yeah. And, and so what, what thing, one thing this does do, this pre-Adamic, I think it answers the question, well, obviously Cain married a pre-Adamic person. Um, 
the city of Nod was populated by pre-Adamic people. Yeah. The flood was what killed off the pre-Adamic people, but Noah was an, at, an Adamite. Yeah. So, I mean, it, ans it does answer some questions. I wonder where you got those uh, terms from. I never heard of an Adamite or uh, <laughs> or yeah, pre Adamite. You know, I never heard of that. Those are new to me. <laughs> okay, so the Adamite, I might have made that phrase, that term up. I'll just call him child of Adam. How about that, right? <laughs> cool. um, so I, I see where it can answer some of those questions. I just don't see any justification for the theory. Hmm. I got you. Yeah, um, like like in the flood theory, I was listening to a video you did, Hunter, about, um, well, I don't think it was about the flood, but it, you mentioned the flood, and I, you and Rob were talking back and forth, and you, were, you guys were talking about, like, certain old, uh, you know, I think, I think old recorded floods uh, that did happen, right? Like, and, and you guys were kind of thinking, well, it could have been this one, and it could have been that one, and it could have been, like, something like that uh, there, there was like a couple options here but I mean that method of trying to figure out what the biblical flood was seems kind of strange to me because like aren't you just taking kind of the word flood out of the text and saying well there are floods that do exist in the world like that's probably the explanation for this verse like is that the process of it or is there a different process no, so the actual, we went to a very specific one uh, that happened within the Persian Gulf, and it was so ca um, catastrophic. There's never been one to the size of this one um, ever since the time period that which we put it in. And so since the entire Persian Gulf uh, flooded within, like, the Euphrates and the Tigris River and everything, there is actually uh, – that's the one that we actually uh, go to. That's the one that we hold on to. There's a lot of – um, food, I guess you could say, behind it to fill it in. You know, there's actually a lot of things pointing to that, um, as well as the time period and how it all kind of represents towards that specific timeline. Well, if if so, a flood happened, sure, I, I can get yeah, it. We're not just saying just a flood happened, and that's the, we therefore choose that that's the flood. What we're saying is, there, we hold to the Noah flood, and based on not only what the Bible says, but also based on other outside sources that are not connected to the Bible, all point to literally where this flood happened, that it wasn't actually a worldwide flood, that it was actually a regional flood, so to speak. And this is the flood that is the best representative of what the Noah flood talks about. Okay, okay, but, but yeah. um, if yeah. that specific flood didn't happen, and there was one in any approximate time range, a hundred years before, a hundred years backwards, then that flood could then be used for, you know, I mean, a flood myth. Uh, if we know about a flood in the past, that says nothing about a man building a uh, mad, like a magical sized boat to then put, you know animals on it and stuff like that i mean so all of that on top it's it is technically just looking at a flood that that could have i mean that that happened around that time and saying like well when you speak about elements, about elements has assumptions on top of it real quick though i have to correct something when you speak hypothetical though that puts in that can literally you can put anything to the table when you speak hypothetical because notice the first thing you said was if 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 and I always notice that when people say that, they literally, anything's up for grabs at that point. And I wouldn't just speak hypothetical. I would actually go to where the evidence points to. Well, I could phrase my sentence differently, but I mean, still, well, it's, well, you're technically saying, like, if, if, well, this I'm might be sure. the That's flood. The, thing. the only thing is, I'm not saying It's still the I'm same thing if you say this might be the flood that it's talking about, because there's. No, no, no. I'm not saying this might be. I'm saying this is the most problematic answer. Or sorry, problematic, probable answer to where the evidence points to. That's what I'm saying. The evidence. So oh, if, if the evidence points to anything other than mythology. I'm if, sorry. If the evidence points anywhere other than mythology, then that's the most likely flood that it would possibly pertain to. Like, so well, so what you're saying? About this. You can you can make a myth about literally anything. A volcano. It could you could mad magic any any magic onto a volcano 
and then point to a volcano and say the magic was probably there because the volcano was there. But that. But that's not what we're saying. So what you're saying um, is, uh, what I'm hearing is, um, there's mythology. That's one theory that this whole thing is myth. Mm-hmm. And the other theory is that it was a a, ca- a, catas- a, a catastrophic flood, right? Mm-hmm. That was in the Persian Gulf, and that was the basis for the stories, right? That there was a flood, but it wasn't a worldwide flood. Mm-hmm. Do you and think there was a and, that's, and that one's the most probable to you, yeah. to, right? <clears throat> Yeah, the thing is, is that the Bible doesn't even teach a worldwide flood. When you look at um, Job 38 and 39, Psalms 104, and if the, Bi- if the writers of the Bible know about Genesis, right, and they know about Genesis 6, and they talk about the flood, well, them being, or at least trying to be consistent, they would purposely write things that go along with it. So when you look at Psalms 104 and Job, Job 38 and 39 and Genesis 6, and of the other passages that go along with it, they actually all speak of a regional flood and not a worldwide flood, especially when you have the Hebrew text um, and a shorter, or not shorter, a shorter list, I guess you can say, and based around how you look at it and everything, we'll decipher exactly how the text is being used and everything. That's why you got to look at both of the Yeah, I bet that there's like more, like you said, food behind this uh, idea, but uh, I mean, if we can establish that they were talking about a potential flood, to, to, I mean, if we can establish that it was based on a real flood, which would be fascinating, um, where do we get anything that might even indicate an evidence for everything else other than the flood, like like the boat and the animal preservation and the, you know, the rainbow and, you know, that that is where... Sorry, just in case y'all hear people in the background, um, that's just people that customers and everything like that. Just saying so, because my dad's like, I have to listen for the friend. Sorry, <laughs> like I said, I'm at work. <laughs> hey, no problem, no problem. Go ahead, Hunter. I mean, uh, Zach, say that again. <laughs> well, you know, if if we can identify that this is uh, even you know even an exaggeration of a flood or something like that uh, uh, that did happen. Um, how then do we take the knowledge that a flood might have been the, the basis for the story to then add on an unrealistic uh, ship with animals and the rainbow and the promises and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Like, so, uh, like in Hawaii, there is there is the mountain, but there is not the Pele goddess of the volcano. You know, there, there's two different things there. Oh, so you weren't up. Uh, that was a question. I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to hear just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, where, where does the Noah's Ark story have come into the flood? Like, how would you propose that evidence could be put to a, an unrealistically large ship with animal preservation and well, the whole promise and stuff like it's that? It's funny that you say that because, actually, since you mentioned Rob before, he actually wrote a paper on how it's actually not in a – the size that what the – because you're talking about um, cubit links and everything, how the size of a cubit and everything. But at the same time, there's, I can't remember exactly what it is. And I'm on my phone too, so I can't pull it up right now. But RC's here, so maybe he can pull up where it's actually not a huge boat as you see the one that Ken Ham made in Kentucky. It would actually be a reeds boat, which is a much smaller size boat. And oh, what, what, what was that phrase? Uh, I think it was a reeds. Oh, I could. I, I feel like I'm totally butchering that because uh, my mind really. I just had a hiccup because the people in the background is kind of distracting me, so I can't think straight right now. Yeah, no uh, problem, no problem. Yeah. But if you actually go to um, the article about that, it actually explains not only about the size of the boat of what it was actually much smaller, um, but also the types of animals specifically that were put onto the boat, where it wasn't literally every single animal in the world because you don't have we're not talking about can- kangaroos and koala bears and penguins and polar bears and stuff like that uh, but in fact there's a very specific text on the kind of animals that are being put on there where actually talks about types of farm animals specifically like the ox the pig um or not the pig the ox um 
the well, I can't remember the Hebrew or the exact text or whatever and listen everything, but it's in Hebrew, just like I said, my mom's a little bummed right now. And I'm a little so, so, what I'm hearing, so let me yeah, what I'm hearing you say, Hunter, is yeah. that our idea, our traditional idea in Christianity for generations was wrong, kind of, that there was a worldwide flood, every animal on the face of the earth died except for uh, you know, Noah's family and two of the species of animals that Noah was supposed to bring on the ark. So that's kind of a, you're, what I'm hearing you saying is that's fantasy, that's not reality, that's not really what happened because we, don't, we didn't understand the text. Is that what you're saying? Actually, what I'm saying is the, the time that those theories actually happened was it started with seven day adventures where they where it was by um by a guy who wrote the book called the lost paradise where he literally takes the bible literal verbatim uh that's where you get young earth creationism that's where you get this kind of ideology and it crept his way into the church that we see today and pretty much it was kind of the same the same that if you don't believe this you're a heretic you're a, you're under rule and pretty much that kind of engulfed over the church and it needs to be honest, to be mm -hmm. to be honest. and rc apologist is here to kind of um is here now i gotta go for right now uh, hopefully i can come right back i just like i said i'm at work so rc you definitely know about that as well so i'll let you handle it but they yeah. have, if i don't come back <laughs> all right okay, fantastic um, thanks hunter hey yeah, rc um just so you know um i'm kevin why do you the um, operations director for uh, Fully Deconverted, and Zek is the, uh, the uh, contributing editor, author, or writer for the for the group. Mm -hmm. And uh, welcome aboard, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I thought it would be helpful because, uh, you know, I understand you don't want to show your face because you want to stay anonymous, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought it was instead of sometimes the face. Facebook back and forth chat doesn't really, it's not really productive, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. So that's why I like to do a video chat. And I want to do this regularly. So I don't expect to have, you know, <laughs> get to the bottom of everything and answer every question on this call because mm -hmm. I don't want it to last more than another 45 minutes, quite frankly. But <laughs> so anyway, tell us, tell us who you are and then we'll, we'll start talking. I'm RC Apologist. I'm a uh, YouTube Christian apologist, amateur voice actor, as well as um, world-renowned candy thief. So I think that's just something to know about me. <laughs> okay, tell me about this actor thing, voice actor. Um, I uh, currently am a part of a team. We were originally called Hero No Hero. We changed it to Studio Horizon, but we um, sort of got into the... Um, pioneering of jumping on the Dragon Ball super abridged um, train before it got to be a main thing. And so we uh, did that. I was, I voiced Vegeta in the Dragon Ball super abridged. Uh, we recently expanded it off to um, Full Metal Alchemist and a Sonic abridged um, for our upcoming project. Okay, fantastic. Voice actor, okay. So um, one thing that, uh, you know, Zach and I were talking about um, the flood. And mm -hmm. I brought up the question to Hunter, because the one thing I'm fascinated with is the pre-Adam uh, mm -hmm. theory. Well, there are multiple theories about pre-Adamism. Um, and then it got into the, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the flood. And mm -hmm. so the bottom, at the bottom of this whole thing is the foundation of basically, is there a God? Uh, is the Bible reliable? What is the Bible? Um, and why do we think it is? So, um, and then you and I talked about, and Zach got into a conversation on Facebook um, concerning some of these things. And you, you made a statement that I wanted to talk to you about, is that um, the statement, I believe that the Holy Spirit is who mm -hmm. the Bible says he is. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit tells us what the Bible says. And you mm -hmm. can't be wrong on that point. Am I... Right. Am I in my, uh, what do you call it, steel manning you or what? <laughs> steel manning, no, that would be an accurate statement. Pretty much what I state that the Bible does uh, tell us that that's the case concerning who the Holy Spirit is and how he operates. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Okay, so um, the question I have for you is why should we, it's probably too big of a question, 
<laughs> um, but why should we take that into consideration? Why should we believe that? Because it's true. Okay, I have a more. Uh, let's let's try this way. Um, so, so I'm wondering, uh, RC, you probably. Uh, how, what would you say uh, if we're talking about Jesus and the Gospels? Um, mm -hmm. uh, where is the reliability to any eyewitness that you know of? Like, uh, do you want to expound on how uh, how you come to understand that uh, some eyewitnesses got into the Gospel and did? Like, are there any eyewitnesses in the Gospel? Yes, we have. Um, Matthew and John being uh, two of them that get named. Um, Matthew wrote his own, and then, of course, John would later on write his own as the last. But then you have Luke and John and uh, Mark that aren't necessarily eyewitnesses, though Mark is getting his information from eyewitnesses. Um, he is getting his information directly from Peter. Um, and then you have Luke, who is a historian, who is going towards all the different eyewitnesses accounts, as is mentioned in Luke chapter one, that he's gathering up all of his information from people that were eyewitnesses. And sometimes in the gospel itself, will make references to people that are hinting at that he got his information from uh, this person's relative or uh, the yeah. person themselves. So, so would you call that, I mean, uh, considering that it was 2,000 years ago, would you call those reliable eyewitnesses? I would, yeah, especially considering the fact okay. that it was like a mass um, conformity, a uh, majority of eyewitnesses that have a harmonization of... Within of, Christian literature, that is. Sorry? So, within Christian literature, that is. Yeah. Within the Christian uh, within the literature, yeah. Go, going straight from there, that uh, just establishing that, um, and observing uh, that in modern times, there are uh, millions of people that claim to be eyewitnesses, uh, even, even Western educated people, uh, of, mm -hmm. that claim to be and, and can explain how they're witnesses of divine miracles from gurus, mystics, psychics, uh, like, for instance, the Satai Sababa guru that people have claimed that has resurrected people, flown into the air, conjured miraculous things, read people's mind. So, so if we have thousands upon thousands of eyewitness accounts in modern times that are unreliable, how, how does... An, how does 2000 putting claims like that 2000 years in the past make them more reliable one the issue that we have concerning now is that some of those things could have actually happened it's just that they decide to attribute them to false things that they don't understand that it was actually Same. god but they decide to, to attribute it to something else because of their minds and their hearts wait you're saying that the, the people the modern people decided to attribute them to false things Right, there are uh, some people who think a miracle. But the, the, test, the testimonies are talking about and such, and they're being deceived in that regards. So, um, so what? So the question will be: How do you know that either we're not being deceived by John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't deceived themselves? That's why we test them. The Bible itself even says, "Test the spirits." So we test and examine all of these things, not just from. Uh, the Muslims with the Quran and the Hadith, and the, test with the, the Christians within the Bible and all that kind of stuff. So, so how do we test? We, test it, we see that the Christian worldview is the most consistent in the way that it's been conducted, whereas when it comes to the other, it doesn't hold up to the standard of consistency yes, in keeping yes. up with the uniformity of nature, the laws of logic and such. Okay, so... That sounds, uh, uh, extremely subjective, though. I mean, because uh, I look at the Bible... And uh -huh. it does not. It does not reflect reality. <clears throat> uh, and then that's just me, you know. Right, uh, so, so and and Islamists would say, well, the Quran is the only uh, script that reflects reality. So there's obviously some perspective uh, problem. Like, uh, it, yeah, a third a third of the world. I mean, how many Muslims are there in the world? I don't know. There's plenty of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot. The, the, so let's say, let's say uh, generously, I guess, or conservatively, a billion and a half. Yeah. We'll say that the Quran says, or the Quran 
uh, reflects the most consistent view of the world. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that's so where how we're do we how do we that. decide? <clears throat> we, test, we obviously disagree with that. The testing, like I mentioned, and when we test to see about moral absolutes, when we test to see about the laws of logic, when we test about oh. the possibility of knowledge, these things do not conform well when we test Islam, especially in regards to the laws of logic. Islam um, would have disagreed with you on that. I know they can oh, disagree. Okay, okay, okay. You said, you said we need to test. Hold on, hold on for a second, Zach. But wait, doesn't wait, mean just saying it is wait, true. Wait, say that again, um, um, RC. We missed that last statement. I said someone can say that all they want. Just like someone can say, well, two plus two doesn't equal four. I disagree with you, sir. It doesn't mean that just because they say it, that it's true. They have to demonstrate their claim. And that's what I'm point, trying to get us to do here is that, okay, let's actually go through it. So, Deb, so can you demonstrate your claim? Yes, so concerning Islam, as I was stating, with concerning the laws of logic, there are various things we can look into, such as some of the issues about, for example, the concept that they have about contradictions. Now, they have contradictions in the Quran compared to uh, the Bible. The way that they settle it, though, is called the doctrine of abrogation. Now, these are honestly convenient for too much of the points uh, that occur. And then, of course, you have the other instances with some form of abrogation, but still also illogical based on other surahs, which the whole abrogation law is supposed to be that the later surahs are supposed to, you know, contradict in past uh, reveling scriptures. And so they'll say that because you have the Quran, this means that the Torah and the Injil, which is mentioned as the first five books of Moses and the gospel, um, that these are abrogated as a result. Yet at the same time, the Quran says, not only says that these come from God, but that they are to still be used by the people. Meaning that if you're a Jew, you are still to uphold to this um, as for your religion, as to be seen as truth from God. Even Muhammad used the Quran and had, or not, not the Quran, uh, the Torah. He was given a Torah and used it and said that this is uh, what we are to follow. So he used the Torah himself, which contradicts what his own Quran stated. So he goes again, what he is talking about. And as a result, the Quran and the Hadith are saying that the Old Testament and the New Testament is still reliable and still to be used today, even though that contradicts the statement of saying, well, that they're corrupt and they, it's only the Quran. So it contradicts well, what's more correct, right? Now, the later ones are more correct. And that's what they're saying, right? Right. But at the same time, they're still saying that the past one is still correct and to be used. And they even use the argument saying that you can find Muhammad in the Torah and in the gospel. Yeah, I, and I agree with you that the, uh, um, that logic is very flawed. I mean, if God's gonna give a word mm -hmm. and it's gonna be reliable for a generation, mm -hmm. and, but then the next generation is not reliable, that's just nonsensical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, um, but I, I don't see that the Bible is any different, really. How so? You tell me why it is. It, it's well, well you're the one making the point that you're saying that you don't see any difference uh, with it. This is, this is like something that I was just, and you know, this could be this could be shirked off as just a sheer and vague opinion, but cool. this is this is my problem. Uh -huh. uh, I have much many more problems than just this, but this is where it starts. This is, um, I don't think if a character that. Uh, an invisible character that you know we can anthropologically perceive and i don't think if there is a super intelligent thing that it would create an an evolving cultural social institution with scripts just like every other other religion and think about this sure what like no matter what no matter how our reality turned out and how many different religions uh, we're going to we were, we were ever going to make um, one would be more successful than the other. Mm -hmm. so, so to say that one is slightly more coherent than the other, even though it bears so many uh, contradictions and uh, you know, sub subjective evidence, like we cannot prove, I don't, I don't know why anybody thinks that we cannot prove that magic happened 2000 years ago. Cannot, it's, it's not, you know, we can prove every, we could have had video footage all the way down uh, if Jesus did all these things up until the cross. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would still, 
be very skeptical, questionable. Like uh, Houdini could have done it. Like it's, it is not that kind of, it, you have to have faith in this thing. You cannot just, uh, you cannot look at it skeptically if you have faith in it. Like you, you can't do both at the same time. Uh, so, so I'm just like, why, why do you think that a God would literally purposely choose to look like a man-made thing? Like it, we, we only have this script and we only have these corrupted manuscripts of, you know, some, some metaphysics, some, some psych, uh, philosophy that makes sense, some morality that doesn't make any sense than some morality that does like love your neighbor and then burn your daughter to death. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's why, a mixed bag. Yeah. Uh-huh. Why do you think that a God would imitate humanity in, in our practice of forming stupid stuff to show himself to us? Like it, it that's, I don't get it. It's not necessarily that it's imitating humanity for the most part he's using human language to relate to humans, just like if I were to go over to Mexico, I'm not going to just simply speak uh, in right, English right. to them. I'm going to relate into the language and uh, dialect that they can understand, just like God would be able to do and relay it in their own terms when he's communicating um, to his people. Um, but, but I understand that. I understand that. But, but think about this. God could have said, like, literally, and I, I mean, it, it's just a thought experiment. God could have said one word. It did not need to look like an ever-evolving social institution with massive amounts of corruption, contradiction, humanity. It did not have to look like that. Okay. Like, so well, it only looks like that to some people. Well, no, that's what it is. I mean, it looks like that to everybody, yeah, but but some of us, be- some of people believe that it has mm-hmm. uh, truth mingled in with the mystery, like. But uh, that it's a contradicting religion. Hmm. But that it's contradicting religion. What is con? What? From your statement, you said that it was a evolving, uh, contradicting religion. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so I would disagree. I don't see where it's a contradicting religion. Um, you know, RC, um, uh, I really want to understand because okay. uh, you're an intelligent man, obviously. No, obviously, um, I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sound intelligent from my, from my uh, angle. Um, and we're, you know, we're intelligent people. Um, there are intelligent, you know, it's, it's a spectrum. Um, mm-hmm. You have atheists who deconvert it for intellectual and uh, reasons. Um, some who deconvert it for maybe emotional reasons, whatever. Um, and then you have those that are Christians that convert it for maybe intellectual reasons, maybe for I've emotional reasons. I've never seen that so far. Uh, I have seen many intellectual Christians. Uh, mm-hmm. It has never been. I, not, to, not to my, I have read books where guys are like, oh yeah, I, I started investigating the Bible and then I, re-. but um, these people, like this is, this is the style that I noticed when it's the, I started investigating the Bible and then I got saved. Like it's a style of thinking where. <laughs> I dropped my computer. Sorry. It's, it's the same line of logic to, to watch uh, somebody in Islam say, well, you know, I was so skeptical of Islam, but then when I found out that uh, Muhammad flew into the sky on a flying horse, then I knew he was the prophet. And it's like, no, dude, you were never skeptical. Like, so, yeah, I've, I've yeah, never so I guess, yeah, um, good point, Jack. And I guess uh, RC, mm-hmm. um, we're, we're on the opposite sides of the coin yeah. here. We are, um, I, we're both relatively intelligent people. Uh, and mm-hmm. how do you, account, do you for account for that? How do I account for us being both intelligent people? <laughs> and, and having such different views. Uh, yeah. oh, okay, I think what Kevin might be getting at is, do you buy into uh, the, every, every, what I would call a cultic institution, I'm sure you but every cultic institution forms a narrative of the non-believer, not every, excuse me, correct myself, a lot of them do, form a narrative for the non-believer. The non-believer 
is ungrateful, selfish, and, and stupefied, and foolish, and uh, angry, and all these things uh, that have nothing to do with our arguments. Uh, so do you buy into that basically typical propaganda of what atheists are, or do you kind I'm, of I'm understand? Or, hmm? Hmm? I said I buy that everybody is that, including Christians, due to the sinful nature of human beings. Everybody's what? Selfish, angry, hateful, all that. Okay, so, so is that is that what you would call original sin, maybe? Yeah. Okay, sinful. Yeah. So, but is that why you think people have deduced atheism? People have how people what? Do you think that that is the contingency of how people deduce atheism sin? Like I don't in, instead of the actual I argument. Care. I mean, I, don't, I can't speak for everyone who has their own different opinions on atheists. I'm not uh, someone that studies in the psychology of how uh, they think, so I'm not going to pretend to speak on their behalf. That's good. That's nice. Okay, so how, uh, have you always been a believer? No. And uh, when did you become a believer? At the age of, uh, I believe, 18 or 19 it was uh, at the year, in the year 2013. Oh, wow, really? That's like only five years ago, dude. Mm hmm. <laughs> well, so, uh, were, what were you parents? raised with? Yeah. Huh? What were you what raised What were your parents? They identified as Christians, but it was more of a what I call the cultic, cultural uh, type of Christianity that we have today. It's just simply you identify as that by name, but do you actually hold to any actual ideas or beliefs? nothing than just simply there may be something out there that exists you don't even know what um and from even saying that well it's possible god could be some alien in a spaceship kind of thing. yeah okay so you became a believer i'm not going to ask you how old you are but um i'm going to assume in your 20s but don't you don't have to answer <laughs> um when, in 2013 what you were 18 well, i can do the math can i so you're 27 no 20 what's the math deck <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh, um, did, uh, how did you do that yeah. at 18? What happened? How did it happen? I heard the gospel from my uh, grandpa after looking into and watching that uh, the Bible mini series that came on the History Channel because they were running a marathon for that, and we had the channel on there for uh, for that. And I had always uh, viewed uh, Jesus as being this sort of a figure of uh, perfection and peace. Um, I was a perfectionist at the time. I thought if someone made a mistake, then, you know, you just, um, you're, you're done. You are dead to me. You're, um, that's pretty much it. If you make a mistake, you're a worthless piece of garbage. Um, and I was uh, drilling that into me during my time in high school because I needed to get my grades up and make sure that I was able to be straight A, which was part of the whole thing that had been going on at that, at that time. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I heard that, and it was about, you know, I asked simply the question, and I even was like saying that I wanted to go back in time, kill the Romans and prevent Jesus from being crucified mm -hmm. if I had a chance. And when I was told that, you know, that uh, Jesus went there willingly on his own uh, to die on the cross for, so that sinners, especially those who crucified him, would be forgiven, that message just completely changed and shocked what I thought about him this entire time, which was you know, easy to do since I never read the Bible. And so I ended up going to my room that night and started thinking about it. And then all of a sudden I felt a bunch of tears crawl down my cheeks. Like it was Niagara Falls. I even looked to make sure it wasn't just some hallucination and actually felt that the floor was a uh, wet. those two spots where the water had come down. So that, that was that moment that I ended up giving my life to Christ at that point and started doing the research in the meantime while doing so. Mm -hmm. Wow, this sounds like a powerful experience. I had a similar experience. I was, I think I was like 14, 15, something like that. Hmm, interesting. So, so, so you're 100% convinced of the Bible, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, that the Bible is true. And mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if you're charismatic or not, or what, what your, I think you said you're Southern I'm Baptist. Reformed. Yeah, Southern Baptist with a reformed Calvinistic tendencies. That's interesting. 
So how, what is it, what it, who, you don't have to give a whole, like a big uh, theological de definition, but the Holy Spirit speaking to you, what does that mean? Who is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? And how does he speak to you? The Holy Spirit is the third person in the triune Godhead. Um, it communicates and speaks in, turn, in various different ways and how it decides to reveal itself, rather it be in, through conviction in the heart, um, through simply, uh, you know, convict and conviction, like I mentioned, um, or causing one that's able to easily understand something. So it uh, works in various ways in terms of the communication um, that it decides to um, use. It doesn't speak verbally as far as what we know from the testimony and the histories and the uh, studying of the word. There's never like a word speaking that the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament um, ever does. The only people that do that would be the Father and the Son. So I won't go into the actual, because you didn't really give a definition, like a uh, foundational of what the Holy Spirit is. I mean, even, even spirit, right, defining that. But how do you know that what you're hearing is not your own voice in your head, um, even when we do know scientifically that our two lobes of our brains uh, mm -hmm. can talk to each other? Well, like I said, it doesn't communicate oh, through speaking and voice. As, as I mentioned before, it doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. But how, do, so if it doesn't speak even in an internal voice, how do you know? It's like I said, it's used by conviction to the heart and to just simply cause a um, understanding. So that's the main way it does a uh, communication. How do you know that? And, and well, another, another word for understanding would be belief. Say so what? Another word for understanding would be belief. Um, well, it would be belief. I mean, there's more to it than simply just that, because the understanding. Uh, I mean, is, well, um, I mean, no matter how much uh, evidence you have for it, belief, you still believe it. Uh, but yeah, I'm not okay. denying that. I'm simply saying it's more than just simply uh, belief when we come to the term understanding. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so what our problem with that is that you know we we've we've lived years and whatnot, felt feelings. We felt a lot of them, all three of us, you know. Um, we've had experiences. Uh, I've, you know, uh, when I was a kid, I did a lot of drugs and whatnot. Uh, felt all, all kinds of funny feelings. Uh, and, you know, felt these feelings like one with the world, like there was characters talking to me. Uh, I did hallucinate uh, several things. It's still do occasionally, just uh, not, not related to the drugs. Um, like, so... My thing is, though, like in the atheist skeptical thing is, um, this phenomenon is indistinguishable from thought. And um, it is the only way that you could ever expect anybody to communicate with something that doesn't exist. It is literally like, how else would you do that unless you are uh, projecting uh, and what, what, you know, people call over sensing agency which we can all do and everybody does um you know when you go to a horror movie and then you're walking down the street uh, that night you know going home and you feel that presence behind you because this is this has just been so fresh in your mind it's not because that thing's there it's because you just exposed your mind to it you thought about it considered it considered all the you know character aspects about it and and that doesn't mean that thing's there Okay. So, so that's, that's where we have a hard time, I think. It's because this is, it's literally the only way that it could work if the thing didn't exist. Okay. So what, um, from my experience, uh, I was a, so I'm, I'll tell you my age, I'm 54, I'll be 55 in January. <clears throat> I was a Pentecostal charis charismatic leader, worship leader, uh, speaking in tongues, um, all of the things that charismatics do. Right. Uh, and I pretty much studied my way out of, uh, when I say studied, I mean studied the Bible and theology, out of Christianity. So when we, when I, uh, I think Zach is right, that when, when I look at it from a rational standpoint, from a skeptical standpoint, I can say, I know that the things that I did were psychological to me. 
and the experiences I had are all explainable from a naturalistic standpoint. So, and that's the default. That's where, that's where I am. So um, if you could tell any atheist, any, or I'll say any skeptic, any true skeptic, that no, there is a rational basis or there is evidence or some kind of indication that we really need to look at, uh, we'll be all open. But so far, that has not been forthcoming. Mm -hmm. that, that is a tricky thing because in essence, to, in order to, to get to some kind of evidence uh, that, that would be required to understand that something is supernaturally outside of the brain, you would, in a sense, have to disprove that the brain is able to do that. But mm -hmm. you can't because the brain is able to do that. That's the problem. Like, it, and, and, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist. Some, somebody might figure out that, uh, oh, I don't think that people can figure out that we can't oversense agency. I, you know, it's, it is humanity. That's what we do. What do you think, R.C.? I mean, I don't think anyone, in my whole case, I don't believe is trying to prove the existence of God. And I don't think we can. I think that it's uh, simple that every, everybody knows God exists and that uh, most people that try to outwardly say that they don't believe in a God or anything like that, they just simply choose to suppress that um, based on their uh, unrighteousness and their wicked deeds. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because that is the, that's the latest, okay, I've been around for a long time. This whole presuppositionalism thing right. is pretty new. Um, and it's, it's actually a kind of an, an ingenious uh, little apologetic move to tell me that, you know, I, I don't believe, I do believe in God. Mm -hmm. But I just well, press presuppositionalism that states this. There are other people that aren't presuppositionalists that say this, like R.C. Sproul, who's a classical apologist, and he comes to the conclusion that uh, all men do know God exists. Um, and there are various others that you can look into the commentaries uh, before mm -hmm. the uh, existence of Cornelius Van Hill and Gordon Clark, and you'll find that they'll say they're pretty much the same thing um, concerning what they read the passages in Romans 1. Um, but, I, but it wasn't scripture or presuppositionalism that convinced me of this. It was actually a scientific peer-reviewed study um, that was done in Finland that convinced me of this, where they uh, tested uh, theists and atheists, uh, hooked them up with electrodes uh, and machines that were connected to it, that would test their nerve responses when asking a series of questions and testing the responses and pretty much the atheists and the Christians responded nervously in the same exact way, if not atheists were much more stronger in their reaction versus the Christian. Oh my gosh, yeah. I would, I would have to hear a lot, a lot more about that study. Well, you know, Zach, I think I, I would totally believe that study. Totally believe it. Because uh, first of all, yeah, I, I wouldn't call R.C. Sproul a presuppositionalist. So you, I think you're right there because I, I've read probably most of R.C.'s books. He used to be one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. But um, this whole study, the, there are times, especially right after I deconverted, I don't know, a couple of years ago, up until maybe six months ago, where I thought, wait a minute, hell, hmm, am I wrong? Yeah, hmm. there are so many you know, that's, factors. Yeah, I mean, that's... This, a, this is, if, if it is not the divine truth, this is literally a belief technology. It's, it's in a technology that's evolved, institutionalized for purposes. It, you know, it, if this is not divine, there is a purpose that there is a, uh, a mechanism where, where if you think, if you don't believe, it's because uh, invisible Satan is whispering in your ear. That these, these are mechanisms that we have to build our brain off of after it's been dug into ours. Like, so I, yeah, I, I kind of get what that is. But, but in the same way, okay, when I was a kid, I had this really weird imagination that... Um, that, like my shirt, by the way? Like it? Yes, like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I was a kid, I had this imagination that when I went into the back room where it was very dark and there was a loft and everything, I, I had this imagination that, and I can't explain where it came from, but that um, astronauts had motion sensors that when I walked through the door, they went invisible. 
And and that was this unfalsifiable, unfalsifiable idea that I had in my brain for a long time. For some reason, as a kid, I was just afraid of that room, and I thought it was invisible astronauts. Now, I grew out of that, obviously. Uh, you know, years later, though, when I was, uh, you know, when I was nine, opposed to five, it, it would still, I would walk in that room, and I would think, oh, oh did, did I, did I, um, did I forget that they exist, or did I reason out of it? You know, I would have that weird doubt and stuff. So our brains have these these illogical latches that we have a hard time getting away with. I I would never say that it's not natural for people to be religious, because it it's because of the way that it is. It preys on our natural functions. Well, I think it is very natural to be religious. Uh, that's just the human evolution, right? And I think there's um, that that feeling in the study. I would have to see the study, but I would almost bet money that um, it wasn't proof that there was a God, but it is proof that all humans have believed in a God and there's conditioning there. Right. And that's really all it is. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic, but I have to say, I, I, like this is just, you know, this argument can't really affect me personally, only because I don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. it, it can't, that argument can't have way on my mind because, because I know that I don't believe in God, I, I can see that in other people too, that they are like-minded in the same way that I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't think I can be convinced that everybody secretly believes in God. I, I've heard the things. So, no, I don't no, think so. I don't think it's, uh, and, uh, and, and RC, um, mm -hmm. Just so you know, when we hear, or when I hear, I won't speak for all atheists or skeptics, when I hear that, okay, all atheists actually do believe in a God, but they, they just choose to reject it because of the depravity, you know, the Romans won, right? Right. Um, that is kind of the height of insult, actually. Yeah. Um, number yeah. one, because I know my mind, and I don't, I used to, but even back then, and my wife's the same way, um, there was a little bit of a question, you know, and I, I was raised, man, in a, in, you know, in a very religious home. Um, I don't believe that there's a God. I, mm -hmm. I would even, I would even, if I was prepared enough, um, enter into a debate to, to prove that there was no God, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to go that far here. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a, it's, I wouldn't, I'm not going to accuse you of ad hominem because I know you're not doing that, but that's what it could amount to. Well, there, there are there are certain pieces of conversation that it I think that some atheists take no offense to, but it is if we were to use the same mode of argument back, it would be considered rude. For instance, uh, how do I know I'm right? I have a friend that is never right, and they told me. I mean, I, I had a friend that who's never wrong, and they told me. But you don't get to talk to him. If we were to say that, okay. we would we would be insulted and, and shut it up uh, with maybe with our own integrity. We, you know, that we just can't do that. Um, which makes things hard because the other side of, well, yeah, we do have an invis invisible friend that is uh, never wrong. You know, so, I mean, there are certain pieces of conversation that make it hard to, uh, I think that that's one of them, the, the idea that uh, atheism, the narrative of, of the Christian narrative of atheism is, is a hard one to get past where it, uh, instead of observing uh, atheist arguments, it, it's, it's observing kind of a fictitious uh, character, caricature of atheists. Uh, so. Okay. So I guess the question to you is uh, when you say that we, we know, you know, we do believe there's a God, but we reject it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, I would say that is not a true statement. Mm -hmm. So how would, you, how would you respond? I mean, where do you go from there? Well, I mean, I simply don't go from there. I mean, I just hold to that as being the case. I don't think why I think I don't engage in the does God exist debates. I have made it clear for people that are trying to get me to engage in those that I don't believe in such things because I believe um, what the Bible says about that. Uh, particular issue, and if someone wants to instead debate uh, the morality of uh, Christianity or the morality of God in the Bible 
or textual variance and textual criticism and all these other different things that I'm more willing to do, but concerned that there's really nothing I can do other than offer a few philosophical arguments, which is what I think is the only thing that we can even come close in trying to prove the existence of God, not using natural means of science um, to conduct and get results of the supernatural, which is using uh, the wrong methods to get something of a different nature and of a different realm. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I kind of, like, I'm tracking with you. There are people in the group who are theists that have the same view that, you know, atheists are kind of silly to try to ask for evidence for God because, you know, God by nature is supernatural. So, you know, he's not going to, we're not going to see the evidence that we're looking for. Um, and I, I kind of see the kind of the genius of that argument. But when I look deeply at it, it means then that God doesn't exist, or he might as well not exist because... Well, it's indistinguishable from non-existence. It's, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's supernatural is not even defined. There's no way to even talk about what supernatural even means. So, so the whole thing is kind of a nonsensical concept in, in, our, in, in an atheist or skeptic's mind. You know what I mean, R.C.? Well, I mean, I think supernatural just simply means that which is um, outside the natural world. So, I mean, what does that mean? Well, I mean, literally, that just that it is outside of the natural world; that it is not in the natural world or the natural. Realm. Yeah, I mean, we, we've rounded back to it's it's indistinguishable from something that is not in reality. Um, I, I was curious, like uh, about we we had a, we had a piece of a conversation the other day about uh, John Dominic Cross. And uh, I was wondering, um, do you think that Jesus really did, um, and th this is just the, the most common example that doesn't like require too much like a, extra explanation. Uh, do, do you think that Jesus really walked up to a fig tree in real life and killed it? Or do you think that that is a, uh, an allegory being told about Jesus? I believe it's real. Okay, so so uh, th this is just sort of <clears throat> gathered, and this is like the criticism of why that it, why it makes more sense not to look as uh, that as a historical event. So, um, you've probably done some homework. Do you know how large those temples were back in the day? Like, do you know what the temple kind of looked like? Uh, the acres, you know. Like no, I haven't done too much into the research into that yet. Oh, okay. Well, the, the point uh, that I was going to get to is that temples back then uh, were very large, like acres wide, uh, you know, filled with vendors and, you know, community whatevers and whatnot. Uh, we, we have pieces of the signs that were on the temples that talk about the militia that were standing guard around the temple that would, that had permission, the signs say that they have permission to kill anybody that disrupts the temple. So, mm -hmm. so we start out in Mark with this story about Jesus coming up to this fig tree and he, he walks up to the fig tree. The disciples point out, oh, look, there's a tree that, and, and it's out of season, so it's not going to bear fruit. Jesus walks up to it and is like, what? It's not going to bear fruit and kills it. So at first, that doesn't really make sense because like, we're thinking, why would you just, you know, this guy who can create literally food and just shoot it out of his hands like he would go up to a tree and get mad because it's out of season even though he made seasons and stuff like that so it's it's questionable at this point so the story stops there it goes directly to the temple where jesus like shuts down all trade from the temple he's blocking the exits he's like turning over the tables yeah and apparently he's fighting an army uh that's like with magical powers because that uh, you would have to fight an army with magic powers if you're only one dude. So this story doesn't look like, I mean, this this doesn't look like what we pictured when we were in Sunday school. I mean, this looks like X-Men, Jesus doing all this stuff. But then, then that part of the story ends and, and the disciples come back to the tree and, and, and it's dead. And this, this is like a Greek literary style of writing where it's a story sandwich where this, the fig tree is symbolic of... Jesus 
like mm -hmm. destroying the temple. It's out of season. It's uh, well, the temple was destroyed. I think the, the temple cult. Yeah, and um, so I mean, this this is a, just an instance where this story doesn't really mean anything significant unless you look at it as an allegory. And and this is what these authors are pointing out. This has been scholarship for like decades. That, and and this is not. To my knowledge, it's not a fringe outlook. There's many explanations like this. Mm -hmm. So what were you going to say, R.C.? They had it. Yeah. R.C., you were talking? Yeah, I was just yeah. simply pointing out that's only those on one side. There's multiple sides concerning the different uh, scholarship theories. In fact, even for the documentary hypothesis, there are a multiplicity of different uh, branches of theories that are, people are disagreeing with each other in terms of that for Old Testament uh, authorship. Um, so just because you know some of the people are getting it in different types doesn't mean yeah, that. Yeah, no, I mean I wouldn't just when trust come any the in issue in of when it comes, when it, uh, but when it comes to the issue about the uh, fig tree thing, um, yeah, there could be people that were guards there, but we have an instance where probably someone could just have been out of their duty, and there you go. Then you have Jesus out of the they're being able to have a chance. Walking um, off the tree the kind of, from acres and kind of acres of space. We have the same kind of thing historically in regards to the crucifixion. We know that back then, uh, if someone was crucified, there was no getting them down and giving them a burial. Um, they were to stay up there and remain. Um, any attempt to do that would get you crucified as well. However, okay, let's, let's, go back to, to let's go back to the, let's stay on the, uh, the, uh, that parable because, uh, like Zek was saying, the temple grounds were huge. There is no way that one man could have driven blocked, out. Blocked entrance. So no, it's, that's what it says in the Bible. Out. Nobody could enter. Nobody could exit. Like th yeah. this is metaphor talking about how this is. I mean, this is a known Greek literary style of writing, a story sandwich. And this same style of writing shows up all the way throughout Mark. Yeah. And... And so, so, yeah, I mean, of course, you could think for some reason that, like, this is talking about Jesus stopping the doors of acres and acres of land, fighting an army, and knocking over tables, or you can think of this in a theological perspective of Jesus is the end of the temple, and he's, he's destroying something that is out of season that can no longer bear what society needs it to and stuff like it, it just doesn't make sense to think about historically okay. do, do you agree or do you disagree well okay so first of all you said he did this to a one that was in a temple mm -hmm. you said that this was in a temple that he did this the fig tree no no that was a that was That's a story the way to the temple yeah that was a story that was wrapped around this the temple of the story it was one story that started temple story and then the fig tree ended it was a literary device a well-known one that you had to learn in greek school in order to uh, okay. be, be a successful educated person okay well i don't see where it's like the fig tree was um, there i only see it was by the road according to the text but considering jesus getting into the place i mean we have where he is being uh introduced and welcome due to his reputation and such and they allow this but by the time he gets there that's when he um, gets that bad reputation by cleansing the temple turning the chairs out and such but also nowhere does it say that he's using quote magic um in fight fighting off these people well no that's the point it doesn't mention anything like that right it, it, it's it's a very vague story that if if you try to imagine it it you you like there, there are these contingent factors that you have to imagine. Like, what did Jesus do about the massive army? What did he? How did he block acres of land with his arms or something? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's the key, Zach, because it's, it's one thing to say, okay, he tipped, you know, quote, he tipped over chairs and and tipped over tables and drove out the money changers and all that. It's one thing to say that, but when you when you see, okay, in reality, practically, how mm -hmm. does that look? How does that happen? And you realize that it's, it's impossible. And then, and then ask yourself, wow. does this story that's wrapped around it make sense? Does it make sense that Jesus walks up to a fig tree and kills it because it's not in season? Or does that very much seem like it's wrapped around the destruction of the temple story for a purpose, which 
is he's referring to the issue of it's it bears no fruit much like israel that's where he's making the application that um the israelites had bear no or no fruit and will be cut off um which i mentioned this elsewhere in different places where it talks about bearing forth good fruit and if it doesn't then it'll be casted into the lake of fire and exactly so exactly that jesus is making but this is a real thing that he did to illustrate the application just like he used a real illustration when dealing with um, should we pay taxes uh, to the Romans? Why not simply say, well, this never happened. This was just a completely fictional, never occurred moment. But we don't do that for that text, but we'll do it for another one. Well, well I, I, don't know, I don't know about that. I might do that. Uh, I might do that with that text too. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, for, for the, bear, then I would just be very desperate at that point is what I would say. Well, I, I would say that... Um, in fact, most scholarship would say most of what, what's uh, said about what Jesus said and did mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the New Testament is uh, mythologized. Right, I don't know, and I'm not going to care. Right, we're not gonna, yeah, we won't go into that. But, okay. but we have to stay on the, the, the money changers. And I think you're, okay, so I don't want the point to be missed. That uh -huh. what Zach was saying is exactly kind of what you said, RC, that Jesus was, he had a point. There was a point, there was a theological point he was making. Okay. That the that, author was making. That the author was making, yes. And that's right. what Beck was saying. Now, right. you've added on that, but the event actually happened. The, an event that is so improbable mm -hmm. and, and even, symbolic. And symbolic. And, and it like doesn't have contingent, like, reality to it i mean uh like like okay just how would you how would you imagine just visually try rc if you were to imagine I'm jesus to, going I this. Imagine this happened from where i live like i'm in the news and we have stories like this where you have a guy who just yanks out all his clothes and starts running in a huge um stadium uh naked manages to get away from the police that try to catch him but that person didn't block all entrance and all exit to the stadium with his arms. Where does it say that he's blocking all the entrances with his arms? I'll have to look that up, actually. Let's look it up. That's a good idea. Because I'm on Matthew chapter 21, where it mentions him cleansing the temple. All it says is that he went throughout all those buying and selling, overturned the tables and chairs. Someone does and said, uh, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. And that's it. Hmm. Okay, let's go look at, uh, let's look at, Wait, um, is that story paralleled in Mark? I think yeah, it's Mark, in all the Gospels. Mark has another account of it, yeah. I think that's what I was talking about, so maybe I'll change it. Okay, so in, in John, uh, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Um, uh, he made a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Um, this is, so you're talking about, I, don't, I can't tell the size, an acre of tables. It would be like going to a fair and driving out every vendor and every animal in the mm -hmm. fair, one person. I'm sorry, that can't happen. And so okay. the, the, example, the example of the guy running around in the stadium naked Okay, yeah. I mean, we've seen street like, Against an armed militia that is going to try to kill you, like, and it's not one guard. It's it's like th this was the Jewish the temple they had. They had peeps around, you know. Uh, okay, this is Mark 11, I think that's where it was. Yeah. Okay, the next day, as they, sorry, I got bad eyes, so I'm bad at reading. Uh, the next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it, heard him say it. Uh, then it switches. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus enters the temple and courts and begins to drive out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables and the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. That's what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. So, so it is literally like, you know, this is not it. 
doesn't say that he's walking there with the Mr. X Men Jesus. Like unless he's like <clears throat> you know, like and with bubble shields and stuff like this, it doesn't really it it looks like an allegory. You'd have to assume that that's the case, or he just simply walks over, and people are usually afraid at that time uh, when they see someone that's coming at them with a whip, and they aren't able to have anything to defend themselves, and they're just going to be able to run Except away. For an army. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, not not only an army, but let's say you got a you know two hundred vendors, and this okay. is a big a big spot. I mean, you've been to a flea market, right? Yeah. And this, you know, we're we're bogging down on this, but I think. It would make, okay, it makes much more sense for this to be an allegorical story. And it tells a powerful message. And it's, uh, you know, I guess a good message if you're uh, a Messianic Jew. Yeah. And um, I would say uh, it's, it's not just that this story, this is not an isolated incident. This is only the one that's only one, fairly yeah. easy to explain. And this is everywhere throughout Mark. And, you know, as I'm not sure if you agree with this, but Matthew and Okay, so, okay, well, and Mark was the original, the, the original, uh, the first thing, right, that the Matthew yeah. and the other ones worked off of. Yeah. So, I mean, so if, if Mark, the earliest gospel, is explainably, like, if it's better explained uh, by parable than, than uh, well, I think there's, there's really, at this point, no way to kind of uh, come to a mutual thing, but I would suggest reading some scholars that have that view just just you know just check it out to because because some of them are really uh, convincing i look at both perspectives but what'd you say rc i said i look at both perspectives and test them out mm-hmm. before the other side hasn't been convincing in their claims they just usually make a lot of assumptions uh concerning things without actually pointing the evidence for example as was admitted all we see is that he just manages to uh, prevent them. It doesn't say anything that like he pulled his arms uh, to these places. And to me, what I'm seeing is simply what has been noted by uh, scholars today, which is that the error of trying to read an ancient text and see, wait, these people don't act like first century uh, ancient people. They need to act like us modern yeah. people. There's so there's much a difference. Behavior. And that's what seems to happen when they're saying, well, would he be doing this? Or, you know, they would obviously have this that would happen and all that stuff, but it works differently depending on the culture and the time period that it's at. And this is what I mentioned in the videos that I've done concerning the issue of, for example, when people accuse the Bible of being supportive of rape, or when there was supposedly genocide with the Amalekites and the Canaanites, even though the text of the Bible mentions Amalekites and Canaanites that exist after the supposed mass genocide that wipes it all off the face of the earth and such. It's about the context of the culture and the language that is utilized. We interpret it in the light of using our own context, then we're going to basically just make up our own different world because we decided to mess up. I I, I agree with that. Cultural, historical context is definitely necessary, and that's why I brought up the historical cultural context of the temple and just the the greek um literary sandwiches and you know there there is more that i i agree with that there's always more historical context that everybody mm-hmm. needs to be aware of like yeah um, <laughs> um I, so i think maybe we can it would be good on another occasion to talk about rape, genocide, all those things that, you know, atheists are all up in arms about, and that, uh, yeah, I'm sure, R.C., you would have a lot to say about that. Would you yeah. be willing to have a discussion about that sometime? Mm-hmm, and I would recommend you check my videos out on that in the meantime. Yeah, okay. of course, definitely. Cool. Um, cool. Is that, like, how do we find, is it a Facebook page or a YouTube uh, YouTube. Channel? Okay. YouTube. Under R.C. Apologist? <laughs> yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so we're we're at an impasse, I think, RC. Um, I think we, we did good. We I think we did good. I think we had a good yeah. discussion. Um, so, how do you how do you feel about it, RC? I think it was good. Okay, good. All right, sir. Well, again, I wanted to. I think I don't know about you, Zach. I think we can call it night. Call call it. Yeah. Day. Yeah, I'm good.
That was, but, that was a good time, Kenny. Yeah, but I wanted to, again, you know, get to know who you were more on a verbal level. So it was good talking to you, RC. Thanks for your time today. And Zach, thank you for your participation. And uh, I think we'll call it a good day and we'll talk to you later. Awesome. All right. I'll see you guys later. Okay. Bye-bye.